everyone. Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Tech Talks. Tech is our middle name. It's the one o'clock block here today on a given Tuesday. And we have Mike Boutet. Uh, Mike Boutet is a 5G specialist and program manager at AT&T. And wow, we are going to talk about a, a status report of 5G. Very important we know about that. Um, not only for our own individual use on, on cell phones, but for the community because it has secondary effects. Hi, Mike. Nice to see you here. Hey, Jay. Thanks for the welcome. Uh, post lunch, and we're going to talk tech. I, hopefully, uh, little, this will be exciting and keep everybody awake. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm sure it'll keep everybody awake. It'll keep me awake, anyway. Okay. So, um, first of all, uh, what a good, what a great job. You know, it's a job that any techie would love to have, and there you are. And so, my question is, how'd you get that job? We want everybody to know how to get your job. Okay, ready, go. Awesome, and let's put a cherry on top in Hawaii, right? So yeah, I've been doing this job for a year and uh, you know, I've had a, a long program, uh, a long history of working the big programs for technology. So I've been involved in semiconductor manufacturing, uh, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, startups, defense, et cetera. So this, this uh, background, I think, and some of my experience uh, and, and timing, you know, timing's everything. And then AT&T had an opening in Hawaii and I jumped on it last year. And uh, I've been working this since like day one of the pandemic. So it's been a great ride. Oh yeah. So talk about the military. You have some military background. What is that and how does that feed into all of this? Yeah, so I, I'm you know, also an Air Force reservist. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm a dinosaur. I never thought I'd get here, but uh, almost, almost 30 years. And uh, currently my role is uh, cyber. So I do cyber, defensive cyber on the Air Force network. My job's in Texas. And I've been doing uh, that, that kind of work for a long time. And just prior to that, I was actually the chief technology officer, uh, chief data officer and deputy CIO. That's a lot of uh, chief information officer. A lot of officers to remember for the Pacific Air Forces here in Hawaii for three years. So as a reservist, I, I came on uh, full time and it was, that was a wild ride too, because we had a lot of different things going on, some international events, as you might remember. So I, I, got, I was there and got to uh, witness all of those. And you're involved in um, one of the uh, tech uh, conference programs, FC, is it? And, uh, you, you, and that's like the Pacific Telecommunications Conference. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jay. So the uh, FCA Hawaii, and for those that don't know, FCA stands for Armed Forces Communication and Electronics Association. And it's a Hawaii chapter. We have chapters all over the US. And um, the chapter here is about 700 members. I'm the vice president of programs. So all the events that we do, I do a program similar to yours, a different, different audience. Uh, some, some of the topics are similar, but uh, it's great because we get to give back to the community. Uh, we involved industry, academia, and DOD. Um, it's, it's exciting. I'd like to tell you more about that later too. Yeah. Well, you know, on the other hand, I'm a little, I'm a little depressed because I, I'll never be able to get your job. And uh, there's a lot of people out there listening to this, and, and they realize the confluence of all these, of all these experiences you've had. It's hard to have the confluence that you have. <laughs> they may I never wanted be to be able a, to get. <laughs> I wanted to be a prosecuting attorney, not for very long, but I know you're an attorney, so maybe we can switch roles for a day and we can have a show on that. <laughs> yeah king for a day which but which one is the king <laughs> well let's talk about 5g 5g a technology that has been discussed you know for i don't know how to say three years i think a very promising very fast um but not quite available it's like still beyond the reach of most people and if i go get a phone that is um you know enabled for 5g it may or may not work can you talk about the status of the penetration of 5G these days here in Hawaii? Yes, so there, there is a lot of hype and there is some reality as well. I mean, if you watch the Super Bowl, you know, different carriers are marketing their products. Uh, I'm with AT&T as, as we've already discussed, but uh, yeah, there's a huge, a huge uh, appetite for faster uh, 5G. It's been being promised for a number of years. AT&T just lit up um, our uh, massive network on the mainland in parts of Hawaii here. That was done within, uh, actually last quarter, I believe. And so uh, massive investments have been made. You know, this is my little sales pitch here, but about $135 billion over four or five years. And then also there was an FCC spectrum where they sell the wireless uh, spectrum uh, auction. That just took place. So um, a lot of the carriers are, are scooping up the wireless for, for future programs. 
So um, a lot of us, to answer your question about what does it mean to us, a lot of us have 5G phones already, I do, and I haven't noticed a big improvement yet. Actually, uh, you know, my 4G phone <laughs> may have worked better uh, in, in spots. So it depends where you are, what phone you have, and what antennas you're bouncing off of. But over time, uh, we're gonna roll out infrastructure, uh, we're going to roll out additional services. The network's going to get better, and the, the user experience should definitely improve amazingly. I'll unpack on one of the points you made. Is, so a lot of money has been put into the 5G network, for sure. Um, I remember uh, seeing a, a piece on television about somewhere in California, I'm going to say San Francisco, they had 5G nodes here and there and everywhere, and, um, and therefore 5G was operating at least in that part of the city. But it strikes me that in order to do 5G, you need different nodes or an extra nodes. You have to revamp the nodes uh, in order to have 4G and 5G together on the same node again. Uh, and the question is, how much of those billions and billions of dollars are just for the nodes? I mean, how much for research and how much for nodes and infrastructure? Wow, I really couldn't answer that question. Um, I'm on the front end of that, rolling it out, and uh, my customers, the, the DOD. Um, but I would say, again, it's massive investments, and it's not just the carriers. I mean, um, you know, many uh, companies are revamping and, and turning towards 5G. And it's not just the speed at which you're getting your data. It's, it's really the user experience that will change everything. Hmm. No, let me drill down on that. So user experience means what? Ah, Is it great user segue. experience of the, of the speed? Or is there something other than the speed we're talking about? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a real simple equation. So uh, your user experience or as a consumer, what do you get out of it? What's, you know, how does this change your life for the better? And so uh, is, there's a few things going on here. First is the speed. That's the upload, download, uh, the streaming time. Uh, over time, we can expect much faster, much greater speeds. So I'm hearing, again, you know, don't hold me on this, but speeds, uh, orders of magnitude, 20, 50 times greater, depending on where you are, when you are, but over time, it's, it's gonna be much faster. The capacity is like a highway. So if you think about, you know, going down Alamona Boulevard here, uh, how, much, how many cars can you get on that, that highway at rush hour? Um, so we're widening that highway and the amount of data that can be handled simultaneously going back and forth and the time it takes for that data to go through in milliseconds is improving. So much so that the, the network is improving so much so that it's actually, um, there's a little bit of a lag right now, and it, it results in different things. But over time, that's going to almost mimic the speed of human thought. So we're not there yet, but we're talking a single digit milliseconds. That's the latency we want to get after. So speed, capacity, latency. And latency is the amount of time it takes the data from your device to transport through the network and make a return trip back. So all of that adds up to consumer experience, which what the user will experience. Please. A, let me react to something you said, and that is this. If I send my signal through the air, it's a um, radio signal that just goes through the air. There's really nothing to impede it. Okay, if I send my signal through an ethernet cable, even a, a what do you call it, a fiber, Fib fiber, fiber optic, fiber optic yeah. cable, there are things to impede it. And theoretically, uh, tell me if this is right, Theoretically, I could get a faster signal through the air than I could get through a cable. Is this true? It, it's true. Um, so, well, the fiber optics is traveling at the speed of light. So where, where some of this is slowing down is it has to go through systems or cybersecurity uh, measures and filters put in place that may impede some of it. Um, there, there's various places along the way that uh, it's going to impede the traffic. And it's interesting you brought up uh, the wireless signals. So there's actually different types of wireless signals. If you think about the, the Super Bowl, um, they were using what they call a uh, millimeter wave um, at the Super Bowl and other places like factories and maybe hospitals and re um, universities that do research, uh, maybe DOD needs. So you're gonna find that we'll use millimeter wave to uh, work certain use cases where you need a high rate of data. The problem is you need more antennas closer together. It's more like a flashlight. So if you get anything in the way, like a tree or some kind of object, you're not gonna get the same, um, same responsiveness, but it's gonna be super fast. So those things we talked about with speed, capacity, latency, all those will drop. The current 4G technology is, is a little slower, but it's working at a, a, 
at a, uh, a wavelength that's, that's lower. It's in the sub, we call it the sub six gigahertz. Um, I know I'm getting really technical after lunch. No, that's okay. But uh, yeah, there's, there's very, it depends where you're talking about. And the use cases, like what are you trying to do? We'll drive so much of this. Well, it just strikes me that if you could solve that problem about the obstruction, the tree, for example, um, and make you know the 5G go around the tree as apparently the 4G does, um, then you could have it really fast. And if you say it's 20 times the existing up and down speeds, that would be maybe even faster than I'm getting on my internet right now, right here on my computer which is a combination of all kinds of cables and wires and speeds, you know, from one end to the other, booting cable under the ocean, I suppose. <clears throat> so uh, something I asked you before the show is, gee, could it be that one of these days our phone using the hotspot kind of uh, mentality, hotspot approach, uh, would be as fast as my internet using, you know, internet cabling? Uh, could it be that uh, I can just put my phone down next to my computer and have a competitive speed using 5G or 6G or whatever coming down the pike? And I won't need any of the routers and all the equipment that goes, um, you know, with the existing Ethernet cable. Yeah, that's uh, you're you're talking about the convergence of uh, of a lot of different hardware, right? So we're we're seeing over time that things are getting compressed. The hardware is becoming all virtualized, you know, hence things like the cloud. You might have heard of virtual machines, which which basically compress and converge the architecture, the, the technology stack, and makes things work a lot faster, easier to stand up and take down, uh, less cost. Uh, that's why the cloud is uh, a lot of cloud offerings are so compelling. So on the front end, the 5G, we're going to see the same thing happening, right? So you mentioned the the phone, for example. That that is a use case. I'm not, you know, I don't. I'm not an expert in that particular use case. But if we were to look at other things that could be devices, like for example, I made a smoothie this morning, and and my uh, my blender is connected, and and my phone, and then my car. Uh, you know, if you have an iWatch, things like that, sensors on your body. So right now, if you were to take a drive from your home to work, all these things are currently connected maybe in some way to the internet. But if you were to take that and again, increase it by orders of magnitude, go from thousands to hundreds of thousands or millions of devices per square mile or kilometer, um, you're gonna find that you're gonna have a whole different experience because you know suddenly you have all this input from devices, you gotta manage that effectively. So it requires a lot of uh, intelligence. The network needs to manage that and the cybersecurity around all that, the umbrella that covers the security piece. But things like uh, everything from satellites to land to things under the sea, uh, our water meters, uh, clean energy use, street lights, our cell phones, things we wear. I mean, it, it's gonna be endless and we're already heading that direction. Um, that's called the internet of things or IOT. So that's, that's huge. And the so what is, what is this gonna do for us, right? How will our lives change? So we can already see some of this unfolding. Um, autonomous vehicles, like uh, I, I came from Phoenix about four or five years ago and uh, you know, Google was doing Waze uh, autonomous vehicles. You can actually get a ride on one of those with no driver, a driverless vehicle. That, that it requires um, a very low latency, um, high reliability kind of wireless connection to make that work. And then when you introduce artificial intelligence and machine learning, which are just uh, mathematical programs to do things that would normally take us a, a long amount of time to do manually, and now we get rid of all the boring tasks and then suddenly we can do an immersive you know, entertainment experience, immersive training experience, virtual augmented reality. Uh, again, going back to the football analogy, maybe you could see um, you know, items, uh, you know, the goal line, uh, multiple things superimposed over the images, player statistics. So those types of things could be uh, could be done. And, and some of those are coming out. Like the one I saw advertised on Sunday was, you know, you can watch the game with seven different uh, screens, for example, uh, or seven different plays happening, uh, angles of the play at the same time. So that's just an example of, uh, you know, the impact of IoT, Internet of Things. Yeah, well, I mean, let your mind fly, really. Um, but, you know, this reminds me of a, of, a, of a moment I had when I was doing radio for Hawaii Public Radio. We talked about some computer program, and a guy called up with a question. And his question was, you know, you guys are talking about computers and all the sophisticated software and everything, but you haven't explained what electricity is. I said, what? What did you say? <laughs> so 
I turned to my guest and I said, this is this one's for you. <laughs> and, and he was stuck with answering the question about what is electricity. But it and it's a parallel to what I'm going to ask you now. And so what is the difference? Guess could say the difference between 5G and 4G or 6G or whatever. What does G mean? And how does it change the guts in my phone? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And you know, I, I don't want to add any more confusion onto that because there's so much hype around around it. Uh, so 4G is the technology we're we're all currently used to, and it's given us you know amazing things. Just think of our you know using our phones to to navigate. We most of us wouldn't drive without it these days. But 5G will will like I said will even bring it to a higher level. Um, you know I I think. We, another way to think about 5G is it's not just the wireless and things that are connected, but it's it's a it's a lot of things, and it's it's not just it's just more than one vendor or more than one part of the industry. So things are going to change on the device and sensor levels. We talked about the, some of those, like the satellites, uh, all the way to the sea, those kind of sensors. Uh, the radio access networks, like you described, the radio waves, which are just as equally as fascinating as electricity. If you think about waves of uh, electrons moving through the air or waves of um, uh, radio frequency moving through the air. And you have unlicensed, licensed, fixed wireless access points that we're, you know, we're using in our homes today. You know, how do we collapse those things? Uh, you have the, the core base station, which is really, it manages all this and orchestrates it all across the network. So that's, that's an improvement in technology. The network itself is getting faster. It's self-healing. It's a nexus for uh, you know many touch points, it's for the you know for intelligent mesh to transport uh, the wireless into a wire and fiber optics, and to manage the antenna and network. So the, all that's going to get much smarter with 5G. It's it's uh, again orders of magnitude better than what we had. And so you know the use cases are just we're just starting to get, grapple with what that means and how. And the future is going to be exciting. You know I can't predict what it's going to be, but we have some use cases we're going to try to roll out here in, in Hawaii uh, over time, and it should be really exciting. Yeah, but, but look, look at the uh, some questions that come to mind. Uh, number one question, in fact, we have somebody who sent this in just now. Uh, why do some people believe that 5G, 5G is harmful to their health? Is this the kind of thing where, um, you know, I could have something wrong with, you know, some, some radio waves that I didn't have before going into my brain? Um, or maybe making me, you know, taking my hair away. Um, uh, you never know. Who knows? Yeah, there's been, boy, if you watch some of the internet stuff, it's it's uh, pretty amazing to see how some of these rumors get started. So because um, a lot of the 5G towers were going up, I'm thinking about in UK, some news I, I read months ago, people were ripping down and burning, apparently burning down cell towers that had 5G because they were linking it to, to bad effects, you know, adverse health effects, and some even amazingly to, uh, you know, COVID. So, and I think, you know, it's a kind of a cause versus correlation. So it doesn't really cause it or it was just correlated in time. And I remember the first wireless uh, networks we started putting up, people had the same concerns and then you know, those kind of faded away. Uh, easy to research this one. Uh, the FDA, WHO, the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, the EU, National Institutes of Health, and many others uh, all consider 5G safe. And this is based on the body of scientific evidence that's that's saying, you know, we, we've tested this and we don't do not see any uh, adverse health effects, and and no no increased risk of cancer. That's also a big a big worry. So you know that's a big topic in and of itself, but. From everything I've read and seen and experienced firsthand, that's that's what that's what the safety aspects are. And the cost, um, you know, if I if I go out and get my my Samsung updated, upgraded, I have a, what do I have? I have a twenty now. If I went to a next one, whatever, twenty one. I think it's uh, twenty one. Yeah, twenty one uh, with five G, enabled for five G. It's going to cost me more. I'm not sure that's because of the five G or just the technology in general. And then if I have to replace the nodes, you know, on the streets of San Francisco or wherever else, um, that's gonna cost somebody some money. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, the consumer will pay for those cost increases. So query, you know, how, how substantial an increase are we facing um, going forward to make uh, 5G ubiquitous 
in this country. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. So uh, what we've noticed is that technology also brings down the price. So when you think of computing, uh, many years ago, I worked in a, in a corporate data center and the cost of the storage was very high, like one ter I forget what it cost, but we, we priced out a terabyte. And we're just, we watched that fall and fall and fall and get cheaper and cheaper. And uh, over time, you know, it makes huge impacts. Uh, so for example, let's take radiology, right? So if you're gonna get a 3D rendering of, of something, you, you've got a health ailment, um, that takes a lot of technology to scan the patient and a, a lot of computing power to um, for a radiologist to look at that and make a diagnosis and store store that information. So the technology also actually makes that all cheaper and faster. So in one respect, you could say, um, it's not gonna reduce infrastructure costs, but the services and the value but from the end user could increase. Um, and in, in the commercial, commercial space, uh, how might that you know, improve like a restaurant's revenues, for example, or a hospital's revenues by, by giving them patient-friendly devi uh, devices and applications to use, right? For, for health purposes, uh, for example. And the reason I bring that up because I actually worked in healthcare for a while in radiology, and I was I saw all that evolve, and, and it was pretty amazing to watch. And I think the same thing is going to happen here. You know, offering a thought about that is, uh, and this goes to computers in general. The idea of having it faster is not just for the thrill of having it fast. There's something else, and that is, if I'm working on something, and I have to wait for the computer to respond to me. Uh, it slows down my thought process. It really does. But if the computer responds to me instantaneously, then my work process uh, is faster and I can work better and I can get more done. I can you know, use the best that I have in my brain, actually, if I'm able to get immediate response. So it's not just a, a thrill. It's not just theoretical. Um, a fast response, a fast in communications, arrangement uh, will, will help me do my work. But let, me, let me ask you this. Suppose, okay, we, we have uh, more nodes, we have new technology, which, you know, it's new. That's the one thing that characterizes, you know, we, we don't know all the corners of it just yet. And especially when you try to put it together with AI, there's all these huge possibilities out there. The first question I would like to propose, propound to you is what about hacking? We have read a lot about hacking. We've read about bad actors, state actors, individual actors, commercial actors, criminal actors, you know, hacking us left and right. And most recently, uh, yesterday in a small town uh, in, in Florida, somebody hacked the water system and changed the percentage of hydrogen peroxide that was going into the water supply for this, this little town near Tampa, near the ball game. Uh, and you say to yourself, gee whiz, that's, that's really awful, um, but that's an example. In fact, a, a new book came out for, uh, by a woman named Pearl Ross just today, uh, talking about all these hacking possibilities and, and sort of terrorism, uh, tech, tech terrorism events that have happened that we didn't know about and that could happen. So query, does, does 5G open up new possibilities for hacking? Yeah, great, great question. So I can speak a little bit for AT&T and then I'll do a, a use case. So, you know, AT&T covers like 99% of the U.S. population and we pro, you know, the, the our cybersecurity services are, are really amazing. We do like something on the order of 90 billion vulnerability probes daily. And, you know, we have these massive uh, centers, global, global uh, network operations center that that uh, check for these types of vulnerabilities and alert our customers and, and try to uh, avoid these things from ever going downstream. So a little bit of background, the, the Tampa one is really interesting because it deals with infrastructure. And uh, you know, these, these types of things have been known for a while. And so here on the island, we have you know, Department of Homeland Security and, and many others uh, actively looking for risks and trying to patch up vulnerabilities. But within 5G, you know, new vulnerabilities will create, you're never gonna have a 100% um, safe, network. So there'll always be new ones. So you got to build in the security right, right from the software development. Um, and, and to do that, you know, we're, one, one of the things we're looking at is, uh, you know, for example, in San Antonio, uh, the, the DOD is trying to accelerate uh, some of the use cases around 
uh, 5G security and cloud. So let's let's take a look at that. What does that mean for the Department of Defense? What does it mean for infrastructure? And San Antonio is very, uh, the, the, the uh, local government is very aligned with th things going on and around uh, Joint Base San Antonio. So they have a great partnership there. Uh, we also have some great partners here, partnerships here in Hawaii as well to take a look at those types of things. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a study. Uh, we better keep better keep track on the back end too. You know, um, one one thing that strikes me: you're talking about the IoT, of the Internet of Things, and and how there are more and more gadgets, you know, on on the on the, the telephone networks and all the networks uh, going forward in every which way. But in Hawaii, you know, we live in a world serviced primarily by undersea cables. You know, there was a time I remember. Uh, we had a number of people at the East West Center working on satellite technology, but satellite technology proved to be too expensive or relative to undersea cable technology. So it's all, or most of it is undersea cable technology right now. Um, so, you know, what's, what's interesting though, is that Hawaii, uh, which is definitely, you know, dependent on undersea cable transmission. If, if Hawaii increases the, the data that flows between here and the mainland, um, it's going to be the, the weakest link theory. And if we don't have pipes under the water that carry, you know, data at a, at a rapid rate, um, it doesn't matter if we have fast technology in our phone. It's going to be limited by the weakest link. Am I right? Yeah, correct. So there are undersea cables and they're, you know, they're redundant and resilient, self-healing to a great extent. But there's also uh, satellite as well. So you have another uh, path, an alternative path for communications to travel, but those can become the bottleneck. So uh, things that, you know, I'm thinking about Starlink, Elon Musk, he's, he's launched a thousand satellites already. I think there was one recently. And the goal is to put like 10,000 satellites into the air. And, and over time, you know, that, that could be another uh, way in which we can manage uh, some of the network traffic. You know, we talked with the uh, commander of uh, Barking Sands uh, just a couple of weeks ago here on one of our shows, and uh, it, it was pretty high tech stuff over there, and the Air Force is running it. Um, and and I wonder I wonder about you know whether Hawaii offers um, employment or industrial opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities in this area. You know, as we were saying, you know, this is new technology. There's a lot of things we don't know about it yet. A lot of you know accessory uses and subordinate technologies that would that would you know able you could hang it on 5G maybe um, and it would be wonderful if Hawaii could finally get its act together on a tech industry a telecom industry and have some of the you know the clever people coming out of UH out of computer science and otherwise get involved and make a buck and develop a an industry that is not tourism you know but diversify the economy into technology, a dream that both you and I have had for a while. But <clears throat> query, uh, what opportunities come to mind when you think of 5G, 5G and these new possibilities and these students and the like who uh, theoretically have had some training in the area? Yeah, great question. So you had a recent episode with Connie Lau, the CEO from Hawaiian Electric, and also Jason Chung from Chamber of Commerce. I listened to that one. It was great. You asked a similar question, and uh, it was it was great because you know we, we want to build uh, a more resilient workforce here. And so some of the ways is you know obviously we we've been pushing. We say we the, um, the folks who've been around for a while realize the importance of STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math. Um, and in my role as a AFCEA VP of events, I indirectly helped support. We, we gave away $120,000 last year to 40 recipients. I think those are the right numbers um, in STEM. So these up and coming folks who are uh, young, young adults who are graduating from high school going into, into college. So we're helping them. That's one way uh, we're, we're doing that locally, but there's so much more that can be done with partnerships. I, I've reached out personally to University of Hawaii and, and Pacific uh, Hawaii University and you know, I said, how can we make the partnerships tighter? How can we engage industry, bring in academia um, and to build use cases for the DOD locally? Um, a lot of more work to be done there. I've got a few ideas on how I want to proceed, but uh, it's exciting. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying that work. A couple of other things come to mind and that is, uh, you know, here we are. Uh, I, I recall in the middle of the Trump administration, he was, he was going to advance 5G. I don't know if you ever 
you know, were involved in that or got the benefit of it. But what he said, he was going to spend some money on 5G, and I never heard more about it. So I'm assuming it was one of those initiatives that didn't go anywhere. It was just, you know, rhetoric. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, China is um, doing 5G, and, and China has the you know, ability through its type of government to uh, make an edict along those lines and, and, you know, and deploy and enforce it the next day. Uh, you know, they don't have the burdens of democracy. Um, and they're ahead of us. They're ahead of us on that. And my, my, I, my impression is they're also ahead of us on AI, which is um, really critical to the future of information technology. So you know, my, my, my sense of it is that uh, while we do have the technology and a lot of this great technology comes out of the U.S. We we're slow in deploying it, and um, you know, query is that consistent with your understanding? And query, what do we do uh, to catch up uh, to make five G put five uh, G a chicken in every pot? You know, have five G everywhere, and thus uh, you know increase the speed at which commerce takes place, and education, and thinking, and communication of all kinds. How do we do that now? Yeah, um, wow, that's a really strategic question. So a company, a country's power, you know, there's many ways to wield it, but uh, strategically, you're gonna have information, um, you're gonna have, you know, the military uh, technology, right? And uh, th those, those will help form, um, you know, defense and economic advantages. And so, yeah, you know, there's, there's countries west of here that have gotten a jump on this, uh, some of the 5G technology rolling out. Um, and a lot of it can be mandated based on, you know, the hierarchical form of government, as you mentioned. Um, I'm still really optimistic because, you know, this, we live in a country with so much innovation and everyone wants to come here and we, we really get the best and brightest. So I, I think, uh, especially with the Department of Defense, they have a, a, a 5G strategy laid out. Uh, they're investing billions of dollars. They're calling industry to action, um, to, you know, to innovate and to, uh, to start building up use cases. So I think we're gonna find, even here on the island, a lot more things happening. So stay tuned. Okay, and on the same note, I wanna go back to the job thing, your job. Where, where does your job take you? I mean, first of all, the first thing is, to be an expert in 5G, what does it take? Do you have to lie awake at night um, thinking about it at two o'clock in the morning? You have to go to special websites and get trained and retrained and updated and retrained again to keep, you know, keep current on this, this high technology. I mean, how do you do that? And will you always be able to do that? And will there come a time, Mike, when you are a dinosaur? Is that coming? Wow, I, I hope not. But I, you know, I've, I've taken a commitment to myself is to be a lifetime learner. So once, once I get past that, it's good. Now I just got to create the time and, and get rid of the distractions to do it. That's the most challenging part. But fortunately, I'm with a company that allows a great, lot of great training. Um, that's a big part of it. And, and I have to be an aggressive student. You know, I'm not going to classes. Uh, you know, there's no class on it. Some of this is, is just breaking, uh, you know, it's being rolled out very quickly and new technology is coming on its heels. So it's, it's a really fast moving train. It's an exciting ride. I, I, I enjoy the job and uh, I would like to encourage, you know, folks that are interested in this. Uh, this is going to be, I think, uh, a really great uh, train, you know, hit your wagon of this and, and start start getting the experience and education you need to, to be part of this. Mike Boutte, AT&T 5G specialist and many other things, a program manager for AT&T. Thank you so much for sharing and answering my questions and uh, engaging in this uh, freewheeling conversation we've had. Thank you so much and I hope we can do it again. I would love to. Thank you, Jay, for all your time and, and the great work your show does on ThinkTech. All right, you take care. You take care, aloha.